7 o'clock, everybody's had their coffee. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome to uh, your council chambers. My name is Shayla Favor. I am uh, one of the council members, uh, chair of the housing committee. Uh, so I am truly excited uh, for today's public hearing. Uh, along with uh, The Ohio State University. Nothing brings me more pride than my alma mater as well being here uh, to provide us with some uh, amazing information uh, around affordability uh, and accessory dwelling units. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not stop talking and allow the council president uh, to uh, introduce himself as well. Thank you, uh, Chair Favor. She was our, our warm-up act. She was getting you guys like energized right, to talk about <laughs> accessory dwelling units and uh, uh, nothing more exciting, you know. Uh, um, but thank you all for being here. Thank you, Chair, for um, for kicking off this hearing. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing from these teams of folks who have done uh, stellar work. Uh, over how long have you guys been working on this project? For a year. So we are, we are certainly excited to, to be at this point to host you in, uh, as, as Councilmember Favor said, the People's Chamber. I um, want to certainly thank our staff folks, uh, Andrew Dyer, um, Councilmember's staff, uh, Charles Newman, CTV, and everyone for uh, putting this hearing together. Also want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Hanlon for uh, your leadership and for uh, your engagement. Uh, and so with that, I think we turn it back over to uh, the chair and and we hear from the students I think absolutely and so uh, to my left and to council president Harden's uh, right uh, we have uh, some amazing staff from uh, the Department of Development uh, if we can just very briefly introduce yourselves and uh, just talk about what you do for the city of Columbus Thank you, Madam. hi I'm Michelle Castro Giovanni I'm the assistant housing director administrator for um, housing and happy to be here today. I'm excited to hear projects, so look forward to hearing from you. Hi, I'm Mark Trabillis. I'm the Acting Administrator for the uh, Planning Division and the Development Department. Also look forward to hearing your presentation. Wonderful. So the intention of today's uh, public hearing is to receive information and recommendations from The Ohio State University students uh, regarding uh, two potential tools for affordability as it relates to accessory dwelling units and developer incentives. Uh, we now have three teams um, and each group will present their findings and take questions from uh, the panel. Each group will have 10 to 15 minutes to make their presentation uh, and then we'll also provide some opportunity for question and answer time. Uh, if you can just remember to speak into the mics and since it is being recorded, uh, we want our folks at home to make sure that they can uh, hear your presentation fully. And with that, uh, we'll go ahead and get started with group number one, um, developer incentives, home ownership. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Alex Deitz. Um, I'm Abby Couch. Good morning, I'm Georgie. Good morning, I'm Robin Duffy. Sorry. Oh, oh, awesome. So the topic that our group covered was developer incentives for affordable home ownership. Uh, the research question that we began with was, oh, sorry. Uh, what can the City of Columbus do to improve incentives to develop affordable housing uh, available for home ownership in Columbus? Um, currently, Columbus developers are underutilizing these incentives, and our goal was to find out why and look at policies in comparable cities to Columbus and figure out uh, what they've already implemented that we could adopt here. Um, as a note, we did not assess rental policy. That was our uh, our classmates, we only looked at uh, policy for units created for purchase. Um, so before jumping into our recommendations, uh, we'd like to provide an overview of the current Columbus policy for incentives. Um, Columbus offers up to $60,000 in a deferred forgivable loan for developers for each uh, new affordable unit created. Now there are a number of restrictions on uh, these units. Um, the buyers must uh, have, have income at a certain level. The allocation can only be allocated for 
certain costs for the developers. Um, now, the, the goal of these restrictions is to make sure that the taxpayer money is only going to uh, uh, providing uh, affordable housing to people that need it. Um, so, um, our first recommendation is to establish strategic partnerships to connect developers and buyers. Um, current policy states that a buyer must be presented at the time of application for funds. This is necessitating that a developer locate a pre-approved buyer to receiving funds for development. This is a huge task and, major, and a major barrier. So we suggest establishing partnerships with the local nonprofits, community organizations, the Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority, and others to act as a middleman to connect pre-qualified applicants on their waiting lists to developers. We also suggest establishing partnerships with credit unions and community banks to market these funds. Um, we also suggest establishing partnerships to identify concentrated areas for development. It is not very economical for developers to allocate resources to smaller, spread out projects. This raises the total investment required. We looked at Levitt Towns as an example because of the boom in affordable home, owner, home ownership that they caused. The assembly line style of construction maximized efficiency and cost effectiveness. Obviously, land is not as widely available at this time as it was back then. So our suggestion is to collaborate with neighborhood organizations to identify a collection of prospective buyers in a smaller concentrated area, enabling developers to economize most effectively and allowing the $60,000 incentive to go much further. Thank you. And I'm gonna go into recommendation number two. Alleviate upfront burdens. And to illustrate what I mean by this, I have to compare the Columbus model with the very successful Minneapolis model. <clears throat> Minneapolis reports that their des the design of their incentive is being utilized almost 100% consistently each year. So developers are utilizing this very successfully. One of the primary differences between the two design models, though, is that in Columbus, developers have a higher hill to climb before they receive money in hand to develop. And one of the key things there is on the front end, Columbus developers have to have a home buyer identified as part of their application before they're ever able to develop. Contrast that with Minneapolis, they the developers there have more leeway on the back end to find their home buyers. Now I want to compare it to a somewhat similar design in Nashville. Similar to Minneapolis, Nashville developers do not have to climb the same hill that they do in Columbus, yet they're finding that the incentive there is not effectively being utilized. One of the key differences and what most likely explains this is the significantly smaller dollar amount that is awarded in Nashville relative to Columbus and Minneapolis. When you stack up 10,000 and 20,000 next to 50,000 and 60,000, it looks like peanuts per unit. <clears throat> so how do you execute on this? What should it look like in Columbus? Bring elements of both models into Columbus, and here's how you do it. Part one, Finance sooner, get the money into the developer's hands by freeing them up and allowing them to delay the amount of time before they have to find that home buyer. The second effective thing that Minneapolis does that you can borrow, they have a standing pool of pre-vetted developers that they can go to who are knowledgeable about this incentive and have been proven to be reputable. You can borrow this in Columbus. Thirdly, um, on the back end, if there's concern about awarding too much flexibility to the developers, you can install a system of checks and balances by using deed restrictions on the back end to ensure that the, they won't run away with that newfound autonomy on the front end.
So our third recommendation uh, would be to expand the incentive, uh, and that could take a few different forms. Uh, so one would be to increase the dollar amount. Um, so again, Columbus's current policy is $60,000 per unit. Uh, Austin, Texas has a very similar developer incentive program, uh, and they offer a similar amount of funds, um, but they offer $60,000 $60, uh, per multifamily unit and then $80,000 per single family unit. It doesn't have to be the, that exact dollar amount or that exact mix, just depending on the type of development that uh, you want to stimulate the most. Uh, Austin also has um, two different routes uh, to encourage affordable housing development. Um, so they use uh, fee waivers and then uh, expedited permitting process. Um, so in terms of the fee waivers, uh, the more percentage um, of units in a development that are considered affordable, uh, the more development fees are waived. So at 10% uh, affordable units, 25% uh, of the development fees are waived. Uh, another 10% um, going forward, so 20% affordable units, 50% waived, and then 100% uh, of the development fees are waived if uh, a development contains 40% or more of affordable units. Uh, the other system that Austin uses, uh, like I mentioned, is expedited permitting. Um, I think uh, for all of us, time is money, but developers are especially sensitive to that. Uh, and any time they're not actively building and working on a project, they consider time and money lost. Uh, so from a 10-year span from 2000 to 2010, Austin found that um, projects that took advantage of that expedited permitting process took 166 days to move through their, through their system, while other multifamily projects took 277 days, which is a savings of 111 days or 40% time savings. Our fourth and final recommendation would be to modify the AMI requirements uh, for the incentive. Um, Nashville has a program uh, where uh, under 60% of AMI is considered affordable, and then they have a separate category for workforce housing, uh, which is 60 to 120% of AMI. Um, this could take the form of a sliding scale, where uh, the higher percentage of AMI that you go, uh, the less money a developer receives um, to try to induce uh, the truly affordable housing. Uh, but that can go on that sliding scale and try to encourage workforce housing also. We think that maybe uh, offering a little more flexibility uh, and lower dollar amounts uh, for workforce housing might encourage those funds to be used a little more. So again, our four recommendations, uh, establishing strategic partnerships, alleviating the upfront burdens for developers, expanding the incentive either through larger dollar amounts or uh, through alternative mechanisms, and then modifying the AMI requirements. Uh, at this time, we'd like to ask if you have any questions for us. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful job. Uh, my colleagues, do you have any questions? Anybody want to kick it off? Great job of identifying everything that we wrestle with every day. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, they're good. So um, I do have some questions. So when you were um, talking to or researching the other cities, did you determine what source of funding they were using for those um, different projects? Um, I can report that. Uh, the city of Minneapolis is using home funds, and I believe as is uh, Nashville. Okay. Hopefully that clarifies. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because as you know, we use home funds as well. And so there's a lot of restrictions that come down from HUD that make a lot of the recommendations a little challenging. But these are all things that we're like studying all the time to see <laughs> if there's some flexibility there. Um, I took so many notes, so you're going to have to bear with me. I had, a, uh, I had a question in the meantime, Go. I'll jump in. Uh, a good presentation again, thanks. Um, and, you know, one question I had, I'm intrigued by the Austin uh, work in regard to the, you know, streamlined process or what have you. Um, I am curious to know in their timing, you know, what the uh, community engagement required is. Uh, a lot of times, uh, those of us uh, city staff will pride ourselves on relatively quick turnaround, but what we're finding is, of 
course, in the, in the world we live in is, you know, development is tough business in the city these days. And, you know, really educating community about the importance of affordability in the neighborhoods and that could even come in the form of increased density and what have you is, you know, really a major sticking point with getting housing done. And it, was there anything you learned from their experience in that regard? Uh, the one thing that I found was that uh, they also found that communication barrier to be very present, uh, and they were kind of unsure how to uh, communicate that clearly clearly to developers, and uh, they did find that it was underutilized in the sense that they thought more developers could take uh, advantage of it uh, if they knew about it, but unfortunately they didn't have any great solutions to do that. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So if if we um, back up to your number two point, uh, just alleviating the upfront burdens, and as you pointed out, sure. our model requires um, a buyer, a home buyer, to be identified upfront. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to just that timetable of um, after the development um, has ended and the project is complete, how long does it take the, a potential home buyer to get into the home? So, so, so for a potential home buyer to be identified on the back end. Oh, okay, I understand. After the project is complete. Yeah, so that coalesces kind of nicely with our uh, first recommendation, which would mean pairing with local nonprofits to also ease and shorten that uh, expedited time. Uh, one thing that we found in Columbus is because of the longer length of time to find certain who certain individuals who meet all of those eligibility requirements was a, a kind of significant stopping point. So you're not seeing a uh, a pool of properties just s sitting around in Minneapolis. Correct. The process seems to be pretty streamlined because Correct. you've got that group of people ready to move ready. yeah they their development office reported that the um, program does not experience any lulls or slowdowns in their execution it's consistently moving on pace and they use between 96 percent and 100 percent of the allocated funds each year year end year end <clears throat> can you speak a little bit more to the deed restrictions just as an attorney you know my eyes always pop up anytime you start restriction putting restrictions on, on, on deeds and, and what have you. What kind of restrictions were you, were you seeing? Funds revoked? Sure, yeah, I appreciate that question as I am in my second year over at Moritz. So, <laughs> so much love for the Hang JD. In <laughs> Hang in there. Um, in particular, what we saw was affordability requirements for length of term. So specifically, they would, in, at the point of sale to the home buyer, they would institute, I believe, 30 year uh, affordability restrictions to ensure that the sale price and the appraisal value did not exceed certain dollar amounts uh, based on the dollar amount of total home funds received by that particular unit. Do we, do we have any restrictions like that? We do. So for um, the developer phase of the project, we have a mortgage on the project. Mm -hmm. And then we um, we release that, and then whatever the buyer takes on as for affordability, that's what the restriction is. Usually, it's five years. Okay. Um, but if they need more money than five than five thousand dollars, then it would be more. It would follow the HUD scale. Yeah. Thank you. Just one question: As we, we were talking, and we were talking about affordable housing in, in general in, in the in, in the city of Columbus, is there consideration given? Um, uh, to specific locations, so and maybe a sliding scale. It's it's one thing to have affordable housing on uh, the far east side, but it's, it might be much harder to get affordable housing in Clintonville, uh, where we where we're actually trying to get mixed income communities. Was there any conversation of? Yeah, great question. I can speak uh, specifically to the Nashville model. They do use a sliding scale. They have a designated. Um, we can call it a hot zone, which is a geographical area where they award 20,000 per new unit versus if developers build outside of that hot zone, they are only awarded 10,000 per unit. So th there is that presence of the sliding scale. I don't know if other models, did you wanna add? Austin has a similar program. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So Austin has, um, 
it's the S-M-A-R-T, so it's um, kind of SMART is the acronym. Uh, so they kind of emphasize uh, developments that are based around transit, uh, particularly. Um, so that's one model, uh, and they do also have uh, specific zones around the city uh, that um, uh, is required to take advantage of that funding. Do you see a lot of developers really moving towards that higher incentive in order to create those workforce uh, development properties, uh, thus fitting that need there? Did you want to add? Um, the greatest participation rate that we found was in Minneapolis, and that was a $50,000 okay. per unit amount. Okay. At the reduced per unit amount of 10000 and 20000 that we saw in Nashville, it's could be called unsuccessful. It's not being used. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Uh, no. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right. We will move on to group number two um, that will talk about incentives as it relates to rental properties. All right. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to present on developer incentives for affordable rental housing. I'm Nicholas Julian. And I'm Amalia Martin. We have more team members, but they weren't able to come today. Yes. That's them. <laughs> All right. To get started, just I wanted to give you guys a little brief introduction and scope of our project. So similar to the home ownership team, our project is prepared for Columbus City Council and sort of presenting our research and recommendations on further incentivizing affordable housing development in Columbus, specifically for rental units. Uh, we begin this with a little background on what currently exists in Columbus, uh, following with some highlighted programs in comparable cities and finally present a few key recommendations. And I believe after hearing the home ownership team's presentation that a lot of our research and recommendations will be complementary to their recommendations as well. All right, so in Columbus, a lot of the money for affordable rental development comes from the home funds from HUD, but we want to highlight a few key programs uh, revolving tax, in tax incentives, including the incentives from the Department of Development and, importantly, the LIHTC program syndicated by OFA. Uh, over the past uh, few decades, there's been thousands of affordable rental units constructed due to these funds. Um, and then also Columbus has the RHPP, Rental Housing Production and Preservation Program, which acts as a gap financing in addition to the LIHTC money. So now Amalia will get into some of the programs in other cities. So we looked for cities that were very similar to Columbus in size, growth, transportation, um, and different things. So we started off in Ohio um, with Cleveland. <clears throat> So Cleveland has very similar programs to Columbus. Um, they do 15-year, uh, 100% tax abatements. A difference in Cleveland was that you had to um, abide by certain green building codes in order to get the tax abatement, um, and that it was still in certain areas, um, in the community reinvestment areas. Um, and then they also do expedited permits and inclusionary zoning um, to help with that. We also looked at uh, Louisville, so a little farther south, um, <clears throat> and they have a mixed residential development incentive program, and so what they do is they allow for the developers to exceed the density requirements uh, or density limitations in certain neighborhoods so that they can have more um, mixed residential uh, builds, and then in order to get the um, Funding, you have to have at least 10% as multifamily building, and then uh, with that, 5% of it needs to be affordable, and you have to agree to have that for 10 years in order to get um, the tax incentive. And we also looked at Minneapolis, like our t classmates, um, and they have a very extensive program um, called the 4D Affordable Housing Incentive Program. 
And if they keep 20% of their units um, below the 60, at or below the 60% AMI rate for 10 years, then they get different things like a, a tax reduction for 10 years. Um, they can get grants to help uh, subsidize the difference in what they would be getting in rent. Um, and then they also can get subsidies for making their units more uh, efficient because that's another way to save money. Um, and Minneapolis had one of the lowest AMI um, ratings for their units, which we thought was interesting um, because they actually are getting at people who are very low in the poverty bracket. Um, and then finally, we looked at Nashville. And so in Nashville, we see um, that they had, their primary program was grants that cover the difference in rent monthly um, between what you would get for market rate apartments versus, or condos or whatever. Uh, versus the affordable. So based on those, we have recommendations. So a quick plug on a bit of anecdotal data that we got from private developers in Columbus on why perhaps they're not incentivized to use housing. But of course, some of the things we heard were, you know, simply not a high enough subsidy for them or there's a lack of essentially technical assistance for them to operate this process. So we focused many of our recommendations on sort of uh, policy-based um, regulation tools and technical assistance to sort of, rather than incentivize through more money in the pot for development, some other tools which could, again, expedite the process, make it more efficient, and thus save money for these developers in the long term. So to start, we, s we wanted to address making uh, local land use and housing regulations more flexible for affordable housing. Uh, one way we can look at through this is through zoning, and one example is a floating zone tool, which could be activated for affordable housing development. Um, another example, which I believe was the Louisville, we saw in Louisville, was sort of an exemption on density restrictions, which could be activated. Um, and again, I wanted to address this sort of technical assistance for developers. Uh, one um, tool we believe which could help is sort of a one-stop shop for the permitting process, which in reality would just look like um, one physical location where a developer could go and sort of get all the permits they need required rather than, um, you know, sort of to, again, expedite this process. And, and simply increasing the developer capacity to build uh, affordable housing for rentals or even home ownership too, but, and I think this especially comes into relevance for the, these mixed income projects that we're talking about. You know, a lot of developers, uh, for-profit developers, their business is market rate housing, so I think there's something to be said for simply how do you navigate the affordable housing development process. Um, and I believe there's also something to be said for uh, developers who work across multiple municipalities in Columbus. For example, if a developer were awarded tax credits from OFA, for example, but then wanted to develop in a neighborhood like Bexley or Upper Arlington, perhaps there's some increased technical assistance that could be provided for just navigating the building codes across, you know, I believe that the sort of um, the, the gut reaction is that in some of these neighborhoods, primarily, you know, the ones that the Department of Development is incentivizing this market-ready category, there perhaps are higher building standards and uh, zoning codes that you have to meet. So again, I think sort of providing some technical assistance there could be valuable. Um, and similarly, I believe Columbus could collaborate with these smaller municipalities in the city. Um, you know, ideally working to make again, zoning and land use codes sort of more um, standardized across the board. Um, and then finally, some education on successful programs to fight this nimbyism that comes into conflict with affordable housing. Uh, some examples we saw are just promoting the realities and successes of programs. And then we just wanted to, again, emphasize that we saw some other cities had some tax incentives for lower AMI brackets as well. 
So in conclusion, we realized that there's no silver bullet for affordable housing. It was indeed difficult to find rental specific programs, but this is where I believe that sort of a combination of these policy based recommendations and some of the tangible incentives that the home ownership group provided can sort of uh, work well together for this. Uh, however, we hope that these recommendations assist simply the conversation into incentivizing affordable housing um, in a manner eliciting higher creativity than just simply increasing the money available. And with that. Yeah, one of the things developers talked about was how there's too much kind of red tape to get through, too many things you need to do. It's harder to be able to have the funding to do the affordable units. Um, and so just trying to make it as easy as possible for developers, whether that's technical assistance, just an easier permitting process, anything like that would be a lot more valuable, it sounds, than increased dollar amount um, because they seem to like what the home ownership team was saying. Time is very important to them, so making it a simpler process. And with that, we will take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful job, you all. Wonderful job. Um, my colleague has just joined. Uh, Council Member Les Brown, would you like to make any comments? Or? I just thank you for your um, hard work on this, on a topic that's really critical for Columbus right now for our future, um, getting affordable housing right. So thank you for your leadership, Council Member Faber. I do have a question Absolutely. for the group. <laughs> um, you mentioned, I think you said Louisville was where they had a grant, uh, or Nashville, I'm sorry. There was a, a grant um, per affordable unit that helped to make up some of the difference in what the developer needed to tar charge to close their pro forma and what the family could afford. Um, was, do you have any background on how long that program has been in existence or if it was controversial? Because um, it, it strikes me as a little controversial. It's like a direct you know, cash payment to the, the developer. Um, so I didn't know if there was anything you saw about that that would be uh, for further context. I do not know. I, like I said, half of our team, you weren't here, half of our team isn't here. So yeah, so we have some of our researchers unavailable. Um, so I'm not sure on that one. So I apologize, but no I can, problem. we can ask our teammates and get back to you. If your teammates saw anything that was worth sharing, it, I, I would be interested in how that has kind of transpired in Nashville or um, really how long, if, and if the program is slated to continue ad infinitum, then that's interesting too. So I find it very interesting. Um, I think you all indicated that you had spoke to some developers in, um, in the city as well, in Columbus, and the general consensus is that beyond uh, just uh, actual financial um, assistance, that it's truly just technical assistance that, they, that is providing the true burden for them to venture into this realm of affordability. And so that if the city could um, perhaps uh, provide additional um, assistance to developers that are looking to dwell into this market that uh, we could we could get some additional folks here interested. Yeah, and I'll just uh, reinforce that. Um, I'll point to, we have a uh, report here that we'll give to you guys when we're finished here, but I'll point to one of our sources which provides a pretty good comprehensive list of beyond just you know, the one-stop permitting shop, but many different sort of policy-based tools that Columbus could use to, again, just make the process easier. And I think it, again, gets at this time is money sort of issue. So, and it's, it's the, um, I can point it out to you in person, but it's the Addressing Regulatory Barriers to Affordable Housing Report. I know the developers currently in, in Columbus are working on a study in terms of our permitting processes and how we could, uh, they, with a question, um, if there was an even more expedited uh, permitting process, what would be the economic benefit for Central Ohio in terms of uh, dollars saved uh, and be able to put back into it? I was wondering if, if they, and I think the study is being done by Deloitte, I didn't know if, if any of if that if that is what folks were referencing, just add, to give us a guiding uh, document to look towards as we're um, having these conversations. Yeah, I think our uh, developer take on incentives was a bit more anecdotal rather than specific to this report. I mean, it was you know just 
uh, conversation where we sort of tried to synthesize the main points a little bit. But that would be interesting. I would be interested in that. Yes, yes. Um, in your conversations with developers, did you talk about, um, uh, did you get specific about neighborhoods in Columbus at all? I mean, I think uh, developers naturally feel a tendency towards developing in um, sort of the highest market neighborhoods mm -hmm. that may already have like a real inflow of development. And part of, I think, a policy objective for this council is to make sure that we're getting affordable housing in every neighborhood. Yeah. So I, I didn't know if there was any feedback on that from your conversations with developers. It's okay if the answer is no. Yeah. I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say, so the only neighborhood-based point that came up was sort of a, a short north situation where there was a frustrating situation where a developer didn't meet the terms of their tax incentives and was able to buy their way out is what we were told. But in terms of um, that, you know, I think that with sort of the de Department of Development incentives, there is, you know, these different, I believe the system now is that there are these distress criteria that based on however many you meet, you sort of fall into this market ready, ready for revitalization or ready for opportunity categories. Um, so, you know, I think there is something to be said for what sort of neighborhoods are really these categories. In reality, what are they translating to? Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And our last but not least uh, group here uh, to present uh, will be on accessory dwelling units. The floor is yours. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Zoe Rader. I'm Jerrica Logan. Uh, I'm Becca Finkus. I'm Jarrett Jordan. I'm Joseph Newton. Um, so, OK, cool. <laughs> Okay, so um, first, um, just on behalf of my group, thank you for having us. It's really exciting to be here. Um, we just want to give you a brief overview of what we'll be talking about today. Um, we're going to start with some background information just on what accessory dwelling units are and what different types exist. And then um, Joe over here is going to talk about cost and different financing opportunities and options for homeowners and also for the city to provide. We're going to touch on a couple of case studies, um, some cities that are like Columbus, but also cities like Portland that are a little bit um, more progressive. And then um, we'll provide our set of recommendations. OK, so first we're going to start off with some uh, background information. Um, so accessory dwelling units are a self-contained home within an adjacent or existing home. Um, so they're typically known as granny flats, uh, mother-in-law suites, or carriage houses, which you may see like in um, areas like Old Town East and even some in like, um, uh, like Woodland Park area. A lot of those houses that have the bigger structures, they mostly have uh, carriage houses that were already built upon them. Um, and uh, so they're used uh, to house family members, friends, um, or you can actually rent them out. And then also a current trend is people use them as Airbnbs, uh, which really isn't our goal in this uh, specific topic. Um, but cities can look at them for um, infill uh, for larger lot sizes. So um, there are some uh, lots that maybe got um, demolished at one point or um, just had a decent sized lot and this would be a good opportunity for those types of uh, lots. And also um, one thing about them is they can't be uh, separated from the structure um, when it comes to them being on one lot, mostly cities. Once you have an ADU on that lot, whoever owns the existing main structure owns that ADU so you can't really sell them off. So this is more of like a rental opportunity and less of somebody being able to like um, by those structures. So um, the different types of ADUs that I'm going to talk about is we have um, three different types, the internal, um, attached, and detached. Um, the internal is mostly used for people who 
it's maybe their kids or their uh, their mother um, or a family member just because it's, it is in that same exact stretcher. So usually they're at either, if you have a larger attic, you can add one in there. You just have to add a, a separate door for them to enter in. And then a more common one is a basement one um, where um, you can just have, if you have a, a large enough basement, just kind of firewall the top and then um, make sure you have a, a, a separate entrance for them. And then you can make that. It's a little bit more work than that, but that's kind of how people um, can do it at least here if they don't have enough lot size. Um, for attached, it's usually just set right aside um, the house, either in the front or the side. Um, and most of the time, they have to look just like the existing structure. In other cities, they usually require you to have um, the same kind of layout on the outside, just so it doesn't look like a totally separate box just attached to your house. Um, and then for the detached, that's probably the most uh, variable option for people who want to rent it out just because you don't have to have somebody actually in your same property you can kind of move it to where your um, your backyard is a lot of people who have carriage houses they can take uh, advantage of this now just because they're so large um, and also you can still use it so a lot of people have their um, garages underneath and then the carriage house on top. So you can either have like stairs that enter in from the garage or I've seen stairs that enter in outside of the garage. And so they can't get into the garage, but they are still a separate unit. Over, oh, sorry. So for cost of ADUs, what we found was the best option was either doing internal or attached because it's more cost friendly rather than doing the detached. And then using materials for this structure uh, around the square footage, $50 per square foot would be using low grade materials. And then going with $100 per square foot, be more high end, better quality. And then the conversion cost would be around $1,000 to $1,500. And that would go into the inspection costs for the conversion cost. But ultimately, what we found was people wanted the internal or the attached versus the detached just because of prices and how much that would consume their, uh, their savings if that's what they were using. And then the financing options. Um, these include refinancing a primary mortgage, taking a secondary mortgage out, or borrowing against another property, which isn't a viable option for a lot of people. So a loan that stood out to us among the list that we provided was the FHA 203K um, renovation loan. This one's ideal for first time home buyers. It, uh, it's more realistic options because of the interest rates and is the, uh, the credit scores that are associated with that too. So we, we chose five cities that have allowed uh, zonings for ADUs for our, our case study. Uh, this research was intended to see what the cities have done and how it can relate uh, to Columbus. Uh, I'm gonna hit on three of the cities that we chose and I'm gonna turn it over to my teammate for the final two. Uh, first off is Minneapolis. Uh, it passed zoning code in, in 2014 to allow ADUs. Um, some, uh, some of the highlights of the zoning code include that the the primary unit or the ADU must be owner occupied, so the owner must live in one of those units. Uh, the ADU must be smaller than the primary unit and can be up to 800 square feet. The ADU must not exe exceed the height limit of the primary unit. No additional parking is required. Um, in the first three years that Minneapolis allowed ADUs, they issued 92 permits, 49 were for interior ADUs, 34 were detached and nine were attached. Um, and then no incentives, incentives were provided to make uh, affordable rent levels. Uh, it's mainly used to encourage density. And if you see the ADU um, pictured on this slide, it cost about $250 per square foot. So it was nearing almost 200,000 for a, uh, a garage bottom with an ADU on top. 
Next, we looked at Nashville. They allowed ADUs in 2011. Um, similar to Minneapolis, the primary unit or the ADU must be owner occupied. Uh, the ADU must be smaller than, or smaller than the primary unit and up to 700 square feet and must not exceed the height of the primary units. No additional parking is required for the ADU. And again, no incentives were provided to, to, for affordable rent levels. Um, the last city I'm gonna talk about is Charlotte. They passed their uh, zoning amendment in 2012. Prior to that, they allowed ADUs for those that were disabled or elderly uh, individuals. Um, and it's allowed to be uh, put on properties that are zoned for single family, multi-family, urban residential, mixed use, or office or business districts. The primary unit slash ADU does not need to be owner occupied. Um, similar, the ADU must be smaller than the primary unit, up to 800 square feet, uh, must not exceed the height of the primary unit. And however, Charlotte does require one off street parking space per unit, so two for the primary and one for the, the ADU. And again, no incentives were provided for, uh, to keep the rent levels affordable. And then I took this, oh sorry, I took this slide from uh, a Charlotte Planning Commission on affordable housing discussion. Um, if you look at the bottom, the, it says uh, targeting considerations. They like to use the bud buzzword opportunity pathway and they wanna use, they're, they're trying to go for an affordable, to, to provide something affordable in the terms of rents. However, they're not providing any incentives. So it's really not, it's not coming, their plan of affordable housing and ADUs isn't really coming to life. What is happening though, is they're seeing the homeowners benefit from renting out the ADUs to offset some of the mortgage costs. So it's really the homeowners that are benefiting, or they're being able to stay in their house longer and being able to afford their mortgage. So what's driving ADU uh, demand? If you look at Columbus, Minneapolis, Nashville, Charlotte, you're seeing huge population growths over the last seven, eight, nine years. Uh, along with population growth, you're seeing rent growth among apartments. Um, so that, that's, that's keeping that affordable level. It's hard to maintain when you have so much rent growth. And some of this is due to demographic shifts. You have millennials that are, that are renting longer, not buying homes. You have baby boomers that are caring for their parents and they want to move their parents in with them, but still to keep their, their parents independent, they can have that detached or attached ADU that they can live in. And then after that, the, some of the older homeowners said that they want to move into the ADU unit when they retire and then rent out the primary units. So it's a, an additional source of income for um, the homeowner. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Zoe for Austin and Portland. So with Austin and Portland, um, we have these, this table to show. Um, it just shows the population um, median rent from 2017, three-year rent growth, um, rent as a percent of income, and renters in a percentage value. Um, I have this table for both Austin and Portland, and it just compares each city to Columbus. Um, so with Austin, um, an inf in 2000, an infill special uses was used to create um, greater diversity and compatibility between existing neighborhoods um, and new developments. We were given, they were given eight options to di diversify the neighborhoods um, and secondary apartments were one of those options. Um, in 2000, yeah, 2015, um, a zoning code was amended to just make it a little bit more lenient. Um, so that kind of included new builds on the lot or um, you can put the ADU above the garage um, as long as the garage was detached from the house. Um, and then the parking requirement was changed and so it was no longer needed as long as there was public transit nearby. Um, and for Austin, incentives are still being looked into. We don't have, they don't have anything that is just right out there for us. Um, and then this graph shows how many ADU permits were given um, 
sorry, I forgot I was in charge of the clicker. <laughs> um, it was showed, showed how many ADU permits were given. Um, 2016 had the largest spike, and we think that's because of the amended zoning changes um, in 2015. Uh, for Portland, Oregon, we have this same table again, just to compare it to Columbus. Um, next one. And so the ADU initiative to increase affordable housing supply in Portland um, was to promote a higher number of housing. Um, there were lenient regulations and incentives uh, the system development changes allowed for creative usage of these ADUs, um, which just included multi-generational living um, and then rental opportunities as well. Um, and so with the rent market being unregulated, some people were using these ADUs and charging market rate prices in order to pay for construction costs rather than making it affordable because they themselves couldn't afford to actually build it. Um, and so Portland is trying to discourage the short-term short rental um, to provide long-term rental to residents um, just in order to make that more affordable, something that's more familiar with uh, the residents. And so the outcome is 621 permits were issued per year between the years of 2016 and 2018. up with a set of recommendations specifically for Columbus. Um, the first being a zoning code amendment to permit accessory dwelling units in all residential districts of the city. We think that this is just a really cool way for uh, the community and specific home homeowners to contribute to the affordable housing um, and also just infill development. So that's just a way to tap into those resources um, kind of not make the city be the only focus of that. Uh, and so we think to uh, prohibit uh, uh, the short-term rental in the zoning code would be really important to avoid an influx of Airbnb usage. So we saw that with many of the other cities, unless, um, unless they prohibited it, that was what they were mostly being used for. And then also um, providing some leniency for developers or for homeowners that uh, have an agreement with the city to provide for low-income households and not the others the five cities that we did focus on didn't do that and so they didn't see that affordable housing just because it's smaller doesn't mean people are gonna not charge market rate because people are gonna rent it so that needs to be explicitly stated and Columbus needs to enforce that so some of these um, options could be no parking requirements if it's within uh, transit opportunities and then also maybe not requiring them to be owner-occupied and letting developers kind of start to integrate into this. Um, but we'll leave that to you guys to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> and then also in our final report, we'll have some text examples of zoning codes that other cities have used. And then my second recommendation was just kind of like the developer incentive group had said, just expediting the process and making it easier. So the people that are gonna be developing these accessory dwelling units are homeowners that aren't necessarily familiar with the permitting process and construction and how to do those things. So I think just making it easier for them to understand how will be a lot easier. Um, also for homeowners, time is money and no one's gonna wanna put in the time to figure out how to get all these different permits from the city to build something in their backyard that ultimately might cost a lot more than it's worth. So not only just expediting the process, as you can see on this slide, um, it's kind of small for everyone in the back, but Santa Cruz does a really good job of this. In California, they have some nice graphics just to make it easier to understand for homeowners um, and just the different steps that you have to go through to make this happen. And then also reducing the fees would be really helpful. No, that's not, it's easier said than done, but um, making it more affordable for the homeowners is gonna make it ultimately more affordable for the renters as well. And then also, another thing that Santa Cruz does that we'll provide you with as well is a design book. Uh, they have a general design book, a finance guide book, 
and then just information about ADU's book. And those obviously take time and resources to make, but those are really helpful and something that homeowners can use so that they're encouraged to do this uh, sort of development. And those can provide uh, financing options, landlord information, because they're also not necessarily familiar with that. And then also example building plans uh, so that they don't necessarily have to hire on a contractor to do that um, and to come up with that building plan, they'll be already ready by the city. And then our third recommendation was kind of starting a pilot program. So as we mentioned, none of the cities that we could find explicitly had affordable housing requirements, but LA is trying something out. A local nonprofit started the Backyard, the backyard Homes Project. And so this is a really cool thing that's they're still accepting um, applications up through this May, so you'll have to watch out for it. We can't really ultimately tell you how it did or didn't succeed, but it looks like it's gonna be really cool. Um, so this nonprofit applied for a grant from HUD, but it's also being supported by the city of LA, and they, all, the city kind of outsourced the development of the incentive program to the nonprofit. So the nonprofit um, built community partnerships and put them all together, so it provides a one-stop shop for homeowners interested in the process. Um, so they have to apply for the program. Only some are gonna be chosen, but it kind of generates some excitement about what ADUs can um, do to help out a city. And then they also uh, are providing financial support. So it's up to a $75,000 loan for constructing a new unit or a $50,000 loan for converting an existing unit. And that can be forgiven in 10 years, but the requirement is that they must rent to Section 8 uh, households. So the only way that you can get involved in this process and get this money and all of these resources is if you rent your ADU um, affordably. And so we think that in Columbus, uh, city staff are really busy people and outsourcing some of that work to nonprofits and community partnerships is really important. Um, and some of those could be Habitat for Humanity or Neighborhood Design Center or even Homeport that don't necessarily uh, have ADU programs right now, but if Columbus is willing to help fund it or help provide resources, then they might be interested in doing that. So yeah, do you guys have any questions? <laughs> that was really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I'm, I'm very excited, just as in listening to you all uh, talk about accessory dwelling units as potential um, solutions to this um, crisis, so to speak. Um, I think it's imperative that there be some component of an incentive for folks to truly buy into it because what we know is that uh, this is not a problem that uh, council can solve on its own, but that we need buy-in from nonprofits, uh, uh, the private sector, other municipalities, um, and also the residents of Columbus. And so that it encourages you um, and empowers you to uh, if you see it being a problem in, in your community, that you could get involved and help uh, in, in solving this problem. So it's a really cool program that I'd love to explore a little bit more. I, sorry, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, Chair. So uh, I had breakfast this morning, spent breakfast this morning with uh, the former uh, Secretary of Transportation, Anthony Fox, who's in town for Morpsey. Uh, and uh, at the end of his conversation, he said that the, you know, the one thing that Columbus needs to do um, is to lean into density. If we're going to uh, solve our issues around trans transportation and transit, if we are going to solve for affordability, we need to uh, have a conversation around density. And he was like, just change uh, your uh, zoning. And I was like, I chimed in like, oh, that's easy. Um, and I mean, he was making a joke too as a former mayor, but um, the, this conversation between density e helping to get us to affordability or density versus affordability, I heard in your conversation um, uh, as uh, uh, pertaining to ADUs, and I just wondered, big picture conceptually, how how do you guys, you know, uh, balance that be, uh, with with um, like the, the end goal? Because I we have been I had, in my office we we talk a lot about ADUs, um, and it's more of a densification conversation that would then lead to high density helps us with affordability, but in these actual cases, the density was happening, but the affordability was not, at least in the short term. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so like, 
with the case studies, we noticed that the affordability just wasn't going hand in hand with it. So I think that's where the city kind of comes in and makes it easier for the homeowners to do this. And then also that's kind of where requiring that the primary homeowner be a primary homeowner and they live in that residence might be a little bit restrictive. Um, it's kind of hard to agree to letting developers develop this sort of thing because that kind of gets tricky um, and questionable sometimes. But that might be a step in the right direction as well just because homeowners, um, there's kind of a twofold where sometimes there's that perception of affordable housing and that might prevent people from doing it as unfortunate as that is. And then also just as we mentioned, kind of some of these, they might be smaller, but they're not necessarily always affordable to build as well. It's but it's not just building like a tiny home, it's, it's a small house. Um, so getting that return on that investment through market rate rentals is just the only option for some people. So I think financial support is also helpful. And question. Just, we found that a conversation around ADUs is a really wonky conversation. Have you seen any other terminology other than ADUs or accessory dwelling units that would make this more of a ki kitchen table yeah. uh, terminology conversation? Well, a lot of people use them for, well, what I saw, like, um, people called them like granny flats. So people were like, <laughs> okay, I think grandma sorry. doesn't want to go to a nursing home or to a different facility. Let's just make her feel independent, but also close to home. So I've seen that being used okay. uh, quite a bit, especially if you have already like the, the lot size for it, or if you have a carriage house, there's a lot of carriage houses in my area. Mm -hmm. And people are tending to try to use them for Airbnbs, Certainly. but they don't see them really as somebody actually living there, living there. So that's one of the main issues is people not trying to just make money off this short term, but to potentially have somebody live there for even a couple of years, because then the longer somebody lives there, the less likely you'll have that turnover and you'll need to clean and do all of that other stuff and it'll help the person actually living there in the long run, so. Yeah. Um, but mostly like granny flats or people with older children um, uh, yeah. in the area, especially in more expensive areas like Portland, where you may not be able to actually leave your house once you graduate college um, or even high school. So having somewhere um, that they can go is, is also a good incentive is saying you don't have to rent it out to somebody you don't know. You could just keeping that density in your lot is also a good idea. So. Yeah. Um, your comment just, I was going to ask, say something different, but your comment made me think about just sort of this definition of affordability, kind of the more, I think there's a natural tension in figuring out how we create a policy around this, because if we um, want to require affordability, um, we'll lose a little bit of the flexibility you're talking about. But if we leave it too flexible, then people are going to naturally, as you mentioned, charge market rate because they want to recover their costs. Um, on the terminology piece, it looks like LA called it the Backyard Homes Project, yes, which I think yeah. is a great, yeah. great term yeah. and, and makes it feel uh, accessible to people. Um, so my original question, though, was, again, just asking for any of you who've participated in the research um, to think back um, on sort of like the qualitative um, observations you made. Um, I think that being a landlord is hard. Um, and I think that um, just on its face, right, de deal like managing that, um, but then also, frankly, being a landlord that doesn't discriminate, right? That you know follows the laws. I mean, landlord discrimination or not just discrimination across the board is um, a problem, and we have laws about it in Columbus, but that doesn't mean that people still don't do it. And so in in LA, you said that there are these community partnerships that help kind of match renters with available units. Um, I don't know if you observed anything that accounted for kind of uh, sometimes the natural biases that too many people bring, um, but also what you think of an idea to, in the same way these community groups are supports for finding renters, what about community groups that could be supports for you as a landlord? Like be be a good landlord, be the, la you know, let's help you understand how to do it and let's help you follow the law and all those things. That was a very long question. Um, but if you have any observations from your research, I'd be curious to hear. Yeah, 
Um, so basically, our biggest recommendation is just adopt this pilot program because it's just perfect. Um, because one of the things that they do address is that they have a subsidy specific for landlords, or there's landlord training and also there's a subsidy specific if you become a certified Section 8 landlord, um, just so that you get that extra training and extra knowledge about how to avoid those implicit biases, biases, how do you say that? <laughs> um, so that they do address that specifically and they give extra funding if people are yeah. willful to do that. Yeah. That's great to hear because one of the things that we hear is um, it's especially hard to find landlords who want to rent to people with children, right? Because children are looked at as bringing complications, but those are very much families that need access to affordable. Um, and so we, we've got to make sure that especially something with a diffuse model like ADUs um, would, uh, you know, we're making sure that every family has an equal shot at accessing the, uh, the opportunity. Thank you. So we do have two speakers uh, that have filled out a slip. Um, Mr. Robert Eaves, are you still present? If you can come up to the podium, I'd like to ask your question or make a statement. And if you could keep your uh, question and or comment to three minutes, please. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, opening this forum up for affordable housing. I love Columbus. Uh, I would like to bring up the, uh, the idea of affordable uh, housing for the homeless. Uh, I am a licensed general contractor and uh, I know that we can build homes for, uh, small homes for uh, the homeless for $2,000 a piece. Uh, and if we got uh, two acres of land for this, then we could put a lot of homes, uh, eight by six or eight by 10 homes uh, on this land and, uh, and solve this kind of problem. It would be very affordable we can have uh, running water and uh, electricity for the person. It wouldn't be very big, but they're not, they don't have very much space anyway living under a bush. It will solve many problems. Other cities, Portland is doing this, and some of the other major cities are doing this. And uh, so I would like to bring this idea up to the city council so perhaps they can create a community for the homeless to build tiny homes for the homeless to uh, help this need uh, in society. Thank you very much. I'm gonna open it up to the students mm -hmm. uh, to see if you uh, have a response. Yeah, I'm so excited that you mentioned that. I'm actually working on, I graduate in two weeks, but an undergraduate research thesis. And the city of Seattle actually has these things that they've coined as city permitted villages. And they have nine tiny home villages for 12 to 50 tiny homes where they partner with a local nonprofit and they contract with that nonprofit to provide funding for um, plumbing and trash removal, but they build those tiny homes with volunteers. They're only $2,500 max. So that is an opportunity that's out there. What, what was the name of the, the village? They're Seattle's uh, city permitted villages, and they have nine of them. Thank you, Mr. Eves. Thank you. Last speaker is Mr. Joe Motil. Hi, everybody, and thank you all very much uh, for all the work you did. Everybody in this room is here because they're all concerned about these issues and really appreciate the recommendations were great. I'm sitting back there thanking yeah, we can do this, we can do that. These are all, uh, you know, a lot of things that can be taken care of uh, here at City Hall and uh, appreciate your work. The, and I hope that uh, this PowerPoint presentation will be available to the public or, and that you'll let us know how we can get access to it. I think it's important to know. Okay, just a, a few questions. And uh, uh, first of all, I was really glad to hear that grants and loans were mentioned quite a bit as incentives as opposed to emphasizing the use of tax abatements for affordable housing projects. I did hear 
Cleveland used something typical of, of uh, Columbus. And, uh, you know, to me, that's, that's an important issue. Uh, I, I, I think uh, one of the problems with tax abatements, and I don't know if you found this in your study, but uh, I think they can actually, uh, they serve as sort of pr counterproductive, especially in certain areas where if I owned a property and I know that that particular area is a community reinvestment area or enterprise zone, that the developer uh, is, uh, you know, they want to buy it. They're going to get a tax savings. I'm going to jack the price of my property. I know he's getting savings. So that concerns me. And I think that's one of the problems we're facing is that uh, the city of Columbus's policy on tax abatements uh, to create affordable housing is counterproductive because the, pr the property value is going to go up. Because if I owned property in the short north, an acre of land valued at a million dollars, and I know a developer is going to, you know, he wants to buy it, <laughs> I'm going to probably, if, again, he's going to get a tax abatement of $4 million, I'm going to jack up my price because I know he's going to get, a, he's going to make my, uh, more money. So, I, I, you know, I, again, Low interest loans, things of that nature, grants, I think are very important. And I also, uh, let's see, I, I was writing down some questions. Oh, it, it was recently reported that $9 million was spent to build about 33 homes in the uh, Milo Grogan neighborhood. And, I was, and that's about a cost of $272,000. And they're valued at roughly about, I believe it was said, about 130. And did you happen to look into like cost reduction in terms of like administrative costs, things of that nature to kind of close that gap up a little bit. And, and, and where are those costs going? And, and, and I, uh, you know, I think it's important. I think it's, you know, I know that there's gonna be, it's, you know, it's naturally gonna cost more money, but is there a way to decrease that huge gap in between there for $9 million we're buying 33 homes and to see if there is something that can be done about that. And also, uh, you mentioned, uh, you spoke to some developers in Columbus, I, I assume, and pretty sure you did. And uh, di what did they say, like, for instance, what was their expected return on their investments uh, for these kind of projects? And, um, you know, what, what did they feel comfortable with and what did you find out about that? So those are my questions. I know I kind of rambled on a little bit there. I know some of you were listening, taking notes, but however you can uh, give me some uh, answers on your thoughts on that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Motel. Uh, students, anyone uh, want to address either one of those questions as it relates to um, developer incentives and, and what they wanted to see as a return on their investment or um, how we can lower those costs for developing large affordable housing um, projects? Yes, ma'am. Maybe start off with the first kind of question I heard in there. There was this, the discussion about the abatements and how on the advantages side it can help incentivize developers but on the back end it can sometimes allow for those developers to then increase their rental price which seems to be kind of a self-defeating uh, tensions um, so uh, just just on that uh, as I'm kind of thinking about it I wonder if if you were to institute some sort of pre-vetting process for developers so that you can build a pool of reputable, um, reputable developers who have a proven either focus or commitment to affordability, similar to what we've seen done in Minneapolis, will that help to kind of alleviate some of the counterproductive rent rising that you sometimes have uh, with those abatements and I think it just speaks kind of to your points earlier about how do you maximize that buy-in can you strategically identify key partners for that any anyone else want to I'll just add that you know I can't speak to the specific inner workings of uh, the whole development process for a market rate development but and my impression is there's pure construction costs and resource costs which um, are probably for aff affordable housing pretty baseline and probably not very flexible, I would assume. So r the other half, of the, the other costs in this gap, which I believe you were talking about with these administrative costs, perhaps that is where some of these um, policy changes could help to address. And 
again, I'm not extremely familiar with the process, but I believe, you know, making it more efficient and expedited would at least help a little bit. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Motil. It, can you all join me in giving a round of applause to these students? I want to thank you all for taking time uh, in the middle of the day to join us uh, to have this uh, incredibly important conversation. I think what we have learned today is that there is no easy answer to uh, affordability. And it is a conversation that requires everyone's input. And uh, what I can tell you is that you have a council that is committed to having this conversation nonstop. Uh, we recognize that there is absolutely a gap in our city, but we also understand um, that it's going to take a lot of these types of conversations, um, many of which will be uncomfortable for everybody. Uh, but we're willing to put in the hard work uh, because it's worth uh, pushing forward in this in this space. And so um, I want to uh, personally thank the students um, and your, your teachers for encouraging you to uh, do this type of research. This job isn't easy, uh, but it's absolutely worth it. Uh, to you all uh, who have decided to be here, thank you uh, as well. Any final comments, council members? I think you summed it up well for us. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, once again, round of applause to you all. Do not be surprised if we uh, follow up with you yeah, just with definitely. some more questions. This was really good work. Thank you. Good to see you.